Hello everyone and welcome to the Church of the Wild Fishermen. This is Ben's Sanctuary. My name is Derek Fogel and I'm Ben's younger brother. I've never known a life without Ben. He was already here when I arrived and I'm going to need to ask the universe for strength and guidance to learn to live my life without him. Ben was my big brother in every sense of the word. He was bigger, older, stronger, more outgoing, more adventurous, more fun, more charming, just bigger, more of everything. Ben was my big brother. And he was my idol. Still is. I frequently mimic my brother's voice, especially his talk to animals voice. His mannerisms were an irresistible mix of charm and crudeness. You know, I'm really gonna miss that. As young kids, my big sister Celeste, hi my other idol, uh, was often my caretaker and advocate, but my big brother, being closer in age, was my playmate and I was overjoyed to be his partner in crime when I could. As the younger brother, I was always in awe of his knowledge, strength, and ability. In fact, I was so much in awe of his power, I would sometimes, as almost every little brother does, uh, annoy him until I provoked him to anger, just to prove that he could really beat the living shit out of me. And then, of course, I'd smirk as he in turn got in trouble with mom and dad. Now, my dad turned us on to fishing when we were pretty young, and I remember following him outside one night in a pouring thunderstorm, thunder booming, lightning flashing. It should have been scary as hell for second grade me, but I was following my big brother, see? He wasn't scared. He was on a mission to hunt night crawlers for fishing. And we caught them, lots of them, big fat juicy night crawlers driven to the surface by rain. My brother knew fishing bait from an early age. Night crawlers, crawdads, insects, minnows, chad, stink bait liver, and yes, the magic bait. I'm not even sure I really liked fishing that much myself at first. I was never good at putting a worm on a hook, no matter how many times Ben explained or demonstrated. But Ben loved the sport, and like a lost puppy, every time I could, I followed my idol, my big brother, to go fishing. And there were maybe one or two times in my life where, out of sheer dumb luck, I caught the biggest fish, and oh my god did I treasure those rare moments when I managed to one-up my big brother. I can count them on one hand. After our parents divorced in 1974, we all moved to Bonner Springs, Kansas with our mom and stepdad. They took us to Shawnee Mission Lake all the time to explore, sometimes rent the paddle boats, but mostly to go fishing, and it was a kid's fishing paradise. We would use tiny little number six hooks and nothing but a can of sweet corn. One kernel on the hook, drop it in the water, we caught something almost every single cast, mostly bluegill, sometimes crappie. We could fill buckets full of hand-sized fish if we wanted to, and sometimes we did, and took them home, spent hours filleting them on the back porch while our mom would cook the fillets into potato chip fish fries and bring them out to us to eat. Ah, the age of innocence. As we grew into our teens, Ben's interest turned from fishing to girls and socializing. There wasn't much in the way of structured entertainment in Bonner Springs, Kansas in the late 70s, but there were a lot of ways to get into trouble. I found enough of them. Ben found even more. We did things like break into the water tower area and climb onto the top of it. We skulked around at night and did petty vandalism. It was thrilling and sometimes dangerous, and we were introduced to alcohol and pot. Ben was always a thrill seeker and a risk taker. All these things, the illicit activities, the highs, they were his thrills, and he always wanted more. At 15, he stole the keys to my mom's car and took it for a joyride. That began the era of him bouncing back and forth between our two bio parents' houses. First to Buffalo Grove, Illinois, and I remember when I was visiting, that, visiting him that summer, I got to be included in a gathering of his friends in his bedroom. It was the first time I had ever tried a bong, and I coughed, 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 until my stepmom came and tech checked on me, and damn, I was so uncool that day. 
Ben landed in the mountains of Colorado after my dad and stepmom bought an office supply store there. And Ben took to skiing. He shadowed the Olympic ski team to learn. He made the Summit County High School ski team. And it was there in the mountains of Colorado in the summer of 1981 that my big brother introduced me to Hacky Sack. Now, in a fit of younger brother jealousy, this is where I make it all about me. I am the Hacky Sack Man. I have been inducted into the Hacky Sack Hall of Fame. I hold a Guinness World Record. I am a local legend in Columbia, Missouri. I am the staple freak show of the Mizzou campus, where journalism students frequently choose me as a subject for their class projects. The first question they always ask me is, well, how did you get started? Well, I was going to a party up in the mountains with my big brother. I always started. You know, I have totally lost track of how many times I've told and retold that story, hundreds of times probably, but it always starts with my big brother. Ben was the one who first introduced me to the sport. Ben was the one who first encouraged me to play. He spent time with me to help me learn, to teach me the basics. He obviously taught me pretty well, and when I got to go to the parties with him, he would instigate hack circles to include me. And I know, in my heart, my lifelong love of playing hacky sack is driven largely by the attention I got from my idol, my big brother, that he gave me when we played hacky sack. And Hacky Sack has been such a huge part of my life since then. It brings me so much joy and happiness to play today. And now, too late, I realize it's all a gigantic life gift from my big brother. And I'm crushed because I never got to tell him that I never understood in time. I never got to thank him for giving me this incredible gift. When he graduated from high school, he went to work for my dad's business. He learned to work on office machinery, typewriters, and calculators at the time. My big brother was a mechanical genius. He could fix anything. It was one of his life skills that gave him work and paid his bills. Then our dad died in a small plane crash, and things changed. He moved to Concordia, Missouri to live with my mom, who owned a small bowling alley there, and he took to drinking even more heavily and wrecking cars. Sometimes he and his buddies would get old cars and hold ad hoc demolition derbies with them. Things like purposely sideswiping guardrails, crashing into each other, and just ditching the damn things. And of course, fixing them up, sorta, to make them run again, too. The culmination of all this was the born loser. Now, the Born Loser was a 66 Chevy Stepside with a rebuilt, balanced, blueprinted engine, a Holley four-barrel carburetor, and glass pack mufflers. It was all dented up from the illicit demolition derbies. Born Loser was spray-painted on the front corner panels, and true to my brother's incredibly crude humor, Eat Me was spray-painted on the bedside. Originally, it, it was a three on the tree, but the shift link it had long since broken, and my brother cut a hole in the front floor of the truck by the transmission, clamped vice grips to the tranny shift levers, and covered it with heavy floor mats. To shift it, you had to lean down, pick up the mats, lean, reach down there, move the vice grips. Man, it took skill to drive that thing, but I'll tell you what, that truck was damn wicked fast. After my own car died, he loaned it to me for a bit. The sound it made just bellowed, RACE ME! And sometimes, channeling my brother, I did get into races with sleek low cars in the middle of the night on my way home from my then girlfriend's house on the highways in Kansas City. It was always fun toying with the challengers. I just held back just a little bit, holding even with them, until we hit this long uphill stretch on the highway. Then I would finally really just floor the born loser, and the raw power of that old beat up pickup truck would just leave those sleek Camaros in the dust. That truck was created by my big brother. It was almost an extension of him. Always banged up, parts of it broken, and custom repaired. And you had to get the hang of driving it and shifting. But if you challenged its raw power, ha 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 ha, you fool! The born loser 
never lost. Ben soon moved to Kansas City, making a living preparing office machinery, printers, and computers. He started Ben Tech Services. He met Alexa, and they had a daughter, Kira. He got a hold of a special edition Toyota Supra. That Supra might be one of the few cars that could have ever beat the born loser at the time. But, you know, fast cars and Frank, quite frankly, drug abuse and a thriving drug dealership eventually landed him in prison. When he got out, he moved to OKC near my sister. He worked for BMI, office machines, copiers. He was certified to work on all kinds of machines. He won awards for his work, best response times, best customer service, lowest recall rate. My big brother really could fix anything and he could really charm the office personnel while he was at it. After that, he moved to Springfield, Missouri, where his love of fishing flourished more than ever. He would float and fish the rivers and creeks in the area, but his favorite was fishing for carp below the dam of Lake Springfield, the source of cooling water for a nuclear power plant. The lake water was unnaturally warm and the carp thrived. I got to go fishing with him at his favorite spot once below the dam where the carp would run across a shelf in the flow of water. It was there he developed the magic bait. Wheaties, artificially flavored cherry jello mix and artificially flavored strawberry soda and it really did have to be artificially flavored or it didn't work. You made it into a paste that you could ball up around a hook. I can still hear him in his low gravelly voice explaining exactly how the carp would just play around with it for a little while and you had to wait until they really sucked the whole thing in their mouth and took off with it before you set the hook and started reeling them in. I was always amazed at how accurate my brother's casts were. He could point out like a basketball sized spot on the back side of that dam and hit it with his tackle from 50 yards away. He didn't even like carp. He just liked the thrill of the fight they put up. He gave his catches away to anyone else around who wanted them, feeding people even poorer and more destitute than him. My big brother for all his rough exterior, had a huge, huge heart. The last time I really got to spend time with my big brother was my 40th birthday 19 years ago when he still lived in the Springfield area. Me and a couple of my friends drove down to meet him. We did a two-day floating, camping, and uh, fishing trip on the James River. The first night we stopped, I set my hammock up near the edge of the river over dry land. The next morning, I woke up to carp feeding in water underneath me. I sounded the alarm, woke up the rest of the party. One of our tents was starting to flood. We lost two fishing poles, a paddle, some tackle, and nearly lost one of our canoes. You know, this kind of a event was really just standard fare for any uh, adventure with my brother. His canoe, of course, had a leak in it, and we hit a rock with it and made it even worse, and we had to stop for emergency repairs. We found some shards of plastic and the remnants of some liquid nails tubes at a nearby bridge construction site to augment the emergency duct tape we had, and of course, the repair worked great. My big brother could fix anything. He moved out to Virginia shortly after, where his daughter Kira was living. He wanted to be near her. He wanted to be a present dad. He spent four years in the Roanoke area, working, remodeling bathrooms, seeing Kira when he could, and fishing. Lots and lots of fishing, of course. But Kira was growing up and about to graduate high school, and she had developed her own life and her own friends. And my brother, he was always restless, always looking for the next big thrill. He moved back to Oklahoma City again, working construction, office machine repair, and eventually driving delivery and running the warehouse for a convenience supply store. It was actually kind of a shady business. He got paid cash under the table for overtime. He drove overweight trucks for delivery and knew every trick in the book to skirt the way stations and checkpoints. My brother was surely in his element here. His recreation, of course, was fishing, lots of fishing. He knew every body of water in the OKC area. Lake Overholzer was one of his favorites. The only thing that could make it better would be to have a boat so he didn't have to fish from the shore all the time. 
you know, he couldn't really afford a boat, a real boat, or licensing, or registration hassles. Uh, but, you know, that was no match for my brother's ingenuity and mechanical genius. He acquired a small paddle boat, like the ones we used to rent as kids at Shawnee Mission Lake. But he didn't want to actually have to pedal the thing, so he cut the pedals off the paddle shaft and custom hacked a variable speed electric motor, all the mounting brackets and pulleys and a drive belt, and all the circuit boards and wires and batteries into the little paddle boat, and registered it as an experimental watercraft. No value, no taxes, no licensing, no regulations, but hey, that paddle boat worked. I even got to ride in it once a couple summers ago when we went down to visit him and go fishing. It was truly a fantastic contraption created by my brother's mechanical genius and true to my brother's incredibly crude humor, he named the boat Astroglide. My big brother Ben was definitely a risk taker. He took risks, and the risks he took created stories, and he told those stories, and he embellished those stories with style. If you couldn't experience the constant crazy adventure of my big brother's life, the next best thing was to listen to him tell all those wild crazy stories that just always got a little bit wilder and a little bit crazier every time he told them. And you know, here's one of his stories. Uh, I took the boat over to Olderhofser for a test ride with a girlfriend. Just put new waterproof LEDs on it, new battery cables, zip tie pool noodles around it, the edges to improve flotation. Astro Glide worked perfectly. She ran like a dream. But you know, there was a storm coming in, so I dropped my girlfriend off at the dock. Then, just as I was circling around to go to the loading ramp, sudden wind gusts from the storm hit me and blew, blew me across the lake, whipping up these huge waves that was crashing over me and the boat. I got blown up against the dam. The waves slammed the boat into the dam and flipped it over. Me, Casanova, all my stuff right into the lake. I was trying to save Casanova and get him to shore when... And you know, this would have been the mother of all Ben's stories if he had lived to tell about it. But weakened by the cumulative health effects of a lifetime of risk taking and smoking, a recent severe back injury and a recent bout with COVID, you know, I honestly don't think anybody knows exactly what happened, but my big brother, my idol, he didn't make it. And even though he never got to tell the story himself, and nobody else could have ever told this story like he could have. His death was the lead news story the next morning. And that is totally 100% my big brother's style. My big brother had a huge, huge heart. He was always helping somebody somehow, somewhere fixing things for people, building things. He recently built this killer tree fort for my sister's grandkids. In many ways, he was like a model communist. He would share almost anything he had with anyone in need. And he would also share almost anything else anyone else had with himself or anyone else in need, too. I mean, Ben was obviously no angel. He was a wild, wild man, never tamed, who lived his life fully, completely, with his foot to the floor on the gas pedal, and never a look in the rearview mirror. You know, as I was going through my photos looking for pictures of him, I realized how few I actually have of him. Even when I visited Oklahoma City and came back with lots of pictures, I often only had one or two of them, sometimes only part of him in one frame of one photo. See, Ben was kind of hard to photograph for the same reason wild animals are hard to photograph. He was constantly on the move, busy working, busy going somewhere, busy meeting someone, busy fishing, busy building, busy repairing, busy partying, busy charming the ladies. You know, he never held still for pictures. That was not my brother's style. Make no mistake, my big brother was hard on things. 
In this way, I'm just a little bit like him. I break tools, I wear things out, I use things up, but you know, I never held a candle to my big brother. I always quipped that he was about as destructive as his own weight in rodents. Our family even had a special term for durability, Ben Rated. We've lost count of how many cars he's wrecked and how many injuries he's got. If we said anything was Ben Rated, it meant that it was nearly indestructible. Nearly. But my big brother could use it up. He could wear it out. He could break it. Ben was as hard on himself as he was on anything else. I once trolled his Facebook timeline and literally found that half of his photos were about injuries and included photos of blood. He always said he was an accident waiting to happen, and he wore those injuries like medals of valor. After he had survived so many mishaps, so many crazy and dangerous adventures, so many injuries, I think we all thought that he was nearly indestructible too. I always said he was tough, tough like a catfish, nearly indestructible. Nearly. Let it be known that my big brother lived his life. He lived his life fully. He lived his life completely. My big brother got more life out of his 59 years than most people could if given two lifetimes. 59 years of a life lived with absolute unwavering intensity. This is not a life to mourn. This is a life to celebrate. Celebrate the fact that my brother has gone on to his next big adventure. I'm gonna miss my big brother dearly, but you know, we still have the stories, lots of stories, the wonderful, crazy stories of my big brother's life. Ben was always my idol, my big brother, my eternal protector. And while we all mourn our loss of a big-hearted man, an untamed force of nature, a master fisherman, my brother is free, free of injuries, free of pain, free of rules and regulations and laws, free of the chains of addiction, free of the clothes of a proper society that never did fit him. My big brother, Ben, is free to fly and soar the skies like an eagle and catch fish like one, too. My big brother, Ben, is free. Let's all celebrate that. <laughs> Goodbye, brother Ben. I love you. <laughs> Love you, Ben. <laughs> I know I can't even really begin to tell the story of Ben's life. I wasn't always there, and he hid some parts of his life from me, and I know he did that to protect me, to tell Ben's story. I need help. <laughs> We're now going to open up this memorial to everyone in a facilitated sharing format. Everyone is welcome to share their thoughts and feelings in a short story or two. And thank you all for attending my brother's memorial service and honoring and celebrating my brother's life. I think I might need to go check my fishing pole. And you know, if you ever miss my brother and you want to feel close to him, come on out. Any place, this good fishing hole will do. He's right here. He always will be.